I'm going to give you a little tutorial on dimensional analysis. For years, I thought dimensional analysis was this strange art, but then I, I later realized, wait, there's a systematic way to do it. And I was overjoyed. For most physical systems, there's a limited number of basic dimensions. And these basic dimensions are mass. And I'll use you know, capital M to represent mass. There's length, right? Distances can be written in terms of a length. Speeds are length per time. So, oh, time, that's another basic dimension. That's kind of it. You can also think of temperature, I guess. But other things like force are just based on these basic dimensions. So for example, force is mass length per time squared. So it could be decomposed into these basic dimensions. There's typically three basic dimensions. I might just add that sometimes temperature is included. We're thinking of things that come from science and physics. You might say, well, what about uh, dollars for studying a financial system? As this force example tells us, other system properties can be given in terms of these basic ones like force. And I will use this symbol of square brackets to denote dimension. So for example, dimension of force are m mass times length over time squared. What about dimensions of the velocity of something? That's going to be length per unit time or the acceleration. That's how the velocity changes with time. So it's going to be length over time squared and uh, so on. So for material physical things, there will be these basic dimensions. We haven't yet said anything about units. There's two primary systems of units. There's the English one, we call it English, but we seem to only use it here, like measuring force in pounds, mass in slugs. Then there's the SI system of units. We need to distinguish units and dimensions. I'm just gonna talk about the main system of units to be distinguished from dimension, and that's the Système International. SI units. We sometimes just sort of reverse it. International system. Here, we measure mass in kilograms, we measure length in meters, we measure time in seconds, we measure degrees in Kelvin. All the other units are derived from those derived units that we attach people's names to sometimes, like Newtons. One Newton equals one kilogram meter second squared it's a derived unit from these basic three which match these basic three dimensions an equation like the equation that we have up above has this equation up here this equation of motion needs to be dimensionally homogeneous meaning all of the terms must have the same dimension maybe i'll put a equation one next to that so an equation describing a physical system must be dimensionally homogeneous. For example, equation one up there, the equation of motion for the bead in the hoop. So if we would write that as left-hand side equals a right-hand side, if you take the units of the left-hand side, that must equal the units of the right-hand side. This denotes, I keep saying units, not dimensions, denotes the dimensions. The length of my car has dimensions of length. The length of the desk in front of me, dimensions of length. The mass of that chair back there has dimensions of mass. Usually these are combined and that's why it's not always totally obvious. If we look up here, if you were to analyze the dimensions, all the terms have the same dimension, but we'll get to that. I first want to mention something called the Buckingham Pi theorem. This Buckingham Pi theorem, it's useful in trying to non-dimensionalize an equation. If we have an equation like this, it's chock full of dimensions, mass and length. If you want to systematically study something, you want to non-dimensionalize that equation. So you could figure out which combinations of parameters are really the most important. So what you'll end up with is an equation that has no dimensions to it, but its behavior will be described by a few non-dimensional parameters, as well as non-dimensional variables and a non-dimensional time. So everything becomes non-dimensionalized. So instead of there being theta and time and five parameters, maybe we'll have something less when we non-dimensionalize this equation of motion. Toward that end, 
We consult the Buckingham Pi Theorem for help with non-dimensionalizing. We consult the Buckingham Pi Theorem. Here's the thing. If an equation has k variable, and here they use variables differently from me, variables, that just means any kind of number. This lumps together what I have called variables as in things that vary with time as well as parameters. If an equation has k, and k is going to be an integer, then it can be reduced to a relationship among k minus r independent dimensionless or non-dimensionalized products or groups, or as we might say, numbers, non-dimensional number, where R is an integer. It's the minimum number of basic dimensions required to describe all the variables. So there's something interesting here. There's this number K and this number K minus R. Let's just rewrite what we have. Try on the equation of motion for the bead. So that was equation one. I'll just write it M R. Remember, this is different R equals minus B theta dot minus M G sine theta plus M R omega squared sine theta cosine theta. If we call these Buckingham pi variables, you know, what it calls variables, what do we have? Let me just go through. We've got the five things I called parameters M R b, g, omega, but then we also have theta and t. According to the Buckingham pi theorem, we have k equals seven variables. Now, how many basic dimensions do we need to describe all of these? To find that out, we just sort of find out the dimensions of everything. Dimension of mass is, of course, m, mass. Dimensions of the radius of the hoop, well, that's a length. You have to do some work to find out what dimensions of B is, but because that equation is dimensionally homogeneous, it turns out that that damping term has dimensions of mass times length over time. Dimensions of the gravitational acceleration has dimensions of acceleration. So it's length over time squared. Dimensions of the angular velocity. Angular velocity is technically the number of radians, which is dimensionless, divided by time. So it's rotation rate is radians for time. Since radians are dimensionless, it's one, and time is t. What about dimensions of the angle theta? You might be thinking, well, isn't that a, a degrees or something? Well, no. For this equation to be true, you got to write the angle theta in terms of radians. And radians do not have dimension. They're not a mass, they're not a length, they're not a time. So they're already non-dimensionalized. So the way we represent that is we just sort of write one. And then dimensions of time are, of course, time. So if you look at how many things do we have here? What basic dimensions? I mean, we only mentioned three. Do we use all three here? We got mass, we got length, we got time. R equals three. That's the minimum number of basic dimensions to describe all of these variables in the equation. What does the Buckingham Pi theorem tell us? It says that this equation can be reduced to a relationship among k minus r dimensionless numbers. k minus r equals four. That means equation one can be turned into a I know it's vague sounding like a relationship among four dimensionless numbers or products groups. So that means we need four dimensionless numbers to non-dimensionalize this equation. Okay, we're, we're going to go through this exercise so you can see. And you actually have choices in what these dimensionless groups are. This is an equation of motion for theta. Let's put a little square one. Theta, the main thing that we care about. The main thing that varies with time is already dimensionless. That's good. Maybe we should stick with that. Theta is one of them. So now there's only three left. What else do we have? We could look at this equation up here. We see that mg, this has units of force. Force is mass length times squared. m r omega squared is also dimensions of force. We could take the ratio of these two. 
the ratio of a force divided by a force is going to be a non-dimensional number. If we take the ratio and we can kind of pick which one is the numerator, which one's the denominator, I'll do this, mr omega squared over mg. The m's cancel out, we've got r omega squared over g. That's a non-dimensional number. We'll call this gamma. That's how we'll define gamma. Gamma is our second non-dimensional number. And notice something about gamma, that r is positive, g is positive, omega squared is positive, so gamma is greater than or equal to zero. It could be zero if we have a non-rotating group. Number three. Now, so well, there's only two more. We can find or introduce a characteristic time scale. This is a standard thing when you have a differential equation where there's derivatives with respect to time. Once we have a characteristic time scale, hopefully this won't lead to confusion, but I'll call it capital T, then we can introduce a dimensionless time. Let's call it tau. It'll be normal time measured in seconds divided by capital T, which will also be measured in seconds. But then this dimensionless time will be our third dimensionless number. The way that we can find a characteristic time scale is we just, we suppose there is one and we rewrite the derivatives instead of being d theta d little t, we write them as d theta d tau and plug them into the equation. What do I mean by that? Well, theta, you could think of it as it's a function of time, but you could also think of it, it's a function of this new thing we've introduced called the dimensionless time which is a function of normal time. In the equation up above, we've got theta dot, which means what? That's just shorthand for d theta d t. Using the chain rule, we could write this as d theta d tau d tau d t. And what is d tau d t? Well, from this formula over here, this is one over capital T, one over the time scale. So that means wherever we have the derivative with respect to the actual time, we could substitute in this, one over T, d theta d tau. Let's look up here. We have a first derivative. We also have a second derivative over here. If you do this twice, here's what you'll get. Theta double dot equals one over T squared second derivative of theta with respect to the non-dimensional time tau. <clears throat> and so this d theta d tau, since theta and tau are both dimensionless, this is dimensionless. So is second derivative of theta with respect to tau. Plug these two equations back into the original ODE. So we've got r one over t squared e squared theta d tau squared. That was the left-hand side. Oh, I guess we had an M. Yeah. And then minus B, one over T, d theta d tau minus M G, sine theta, plus M R omega squared sine theta, cosine theta. Let's divide everything by M. So just divide through by M. I want you to look at how we defined gamma up here. It's r omega squared divided by g. And it looks like we're close to getting that in this formula if we divide everything by g. So let's divide by g. And this goes away. g, r over g. We can put parentheses around this and say, oh, this is gamma. Everything is non-dimensional. This is a non-dimensional term. This is a non-dimensional term. This whole thing is non-dimensional. And because d theta d tau is non-dimensional, move this minus sign, we've got that this is non-dimensional, and so is this. And now we have a choice. We're going to pick a characteristic time scale to make one of these non-dimensional parameters equal to one. This problem's interesting in that there's a choice. Sometimes in other equations, one thing just pops out. Here we have a choice of what to pick for the characteristic time scale. We wanna make one of these two terms four to one, but you may as well just set it equal to one. If one of them is set equal to one, then the other one will be some number. It'll be some other non-dimensional number that's not necessarily one. What we're going to do is pick a time scale 
that's related to the damping parameter, the friction B, just because we have to pick something. And actually uh, looking ahead, I know that that makes the problem interesting. We will choose B over MG T equal to one so that the characteristic time scale is B over MG. That sets what the non-dimensional time will be. What did we pick? We picked this to be non-dimensional by a choice of T. So that's in some sense, number three, that was the third thing. The last one just sort of given to us by this first term here in purple, because for that choice of t, what does that become? Scale t, get what? We get r over g t squared. This ends up being r over g mg over b squared. It's got to be non-dimensional, and it is. We'll call it epsilon. So epsilon is m squared g r over B squared. So this is our fourth and final non-dimensional number. So now our equation of motion can be written in its non-dimensionalized form. I think we call that equation one. We did make a choice, a choice of time scale. We might not say this is the non-dimensional form, it's just a non-dimensional form. We've got epsilon times this second order derivative term equals, uh, because of our choice of time scale, the coefficient of the damping term is just one. And then there's also coefficient one in front of this gravity term. And then gamma. Um, oh, I guess another thing to know is epsilon is greater than or equal to zero as well. Gamma sine theta cosine theta. What are we left with? We have theta changing with the non-dimensional time tau. So I'd say we have one dependent variable theta, one independent variable tau, and two parameters, just two, epsilon and gamma. And we have interpretations. I think epsilon is an inertial term. Epsilon gives the relative importance of inertia to damping, and gamma is related to the relative importance of, relative importance of the rotational effect to gravity. So in this case, these have interpretations. Before we go on and analyze this, are there any other cases of non-dimensional numbers that you've come across? Any famous ones? Reynolds number? Yeah, yeah, and the Reynolds number or like inertia to viscosity. Fluids has lots of non-dimensional non numbers. Reynolds is the big one. In fact, I guess you could think of Reynolds as a bifurcation parameter. For low values of Reynolds number, it's laminar flow. And then at some point, as you turn the knob of Reynolds number, there's turbulence. And so that's one of the big unsolved things is, well, okay, exactly how is the Reynolds number a bifurcation parameter and what's really going on in the infinite dimensional space of the fluid?